This is episode 62 of the 99 Forever podcast. I'm Eric Friesen, and my guest tonight is making his second appearance on the podcast. He's a content contributor with HockeyFights.com, Post Cologne. Post, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man, it's good to talk to you again. Uh, the last time you were on the show, the Oilers had just taken a commanding 3-1 series lead in their second round series against the Flames, and then that day we recorded the episode, Connor McDavid scored the series-winning overtime goal at the Saddle Dome to send the Oilers to the Western Conference Final for the first time in 16 years. Uh, tell me, where were you when he scored the goal, and uh, what does that victory, you know, where does it rank for you uh, in your time as a fan of this team? Uh, so I was working at uh, a local watering hole, and uh, it was electric. It was as if uh, we were at the game itself. Um, just that whole run, it really took me back to 2006, um, except this time I was of legal drinking age, which <laughs> which changes things a bit. Um, yeah, that that goal um, to me, and I know this sounds a little petty, it, it was as close as I can imagine winning the Stanley Cup to feel like. Yeah, I mean, when you think back on it, like... I, I look at the 2006 cup run always, right? I mean, that, that for me was the most fun I've ever had watching hockey. And uh, my two favorite moments from that spring were Alish Hemsky's go ahead goal with just over a minute on the clock to eliminate the Detroit Red Wings in the first round of the playoffs. And Fernando Pisani's shorthanded overtime winner in game five of the Stanley cup final. But I would put McDavid's overtime goal right up there with those two. And the fact that he scored it against the Oilers' biggest rival in their building made it even better. Yeah, without question, it's my favorite hockey memory. Wow. I mean, and look, I'm sure that there's going to be a lot of Oilers fans of our vintage that would have uh, that opinion, too, just because we weren't around for the glory days. I mean, I was two years old the last time they beat the Flames in 1991. So even though I was alive for it, you can't really enjoy it at that age. So yeah, to uh, to have a, a great playoff moment like that against your biggest rival when you're at an, an age when you can really enjoy it, uh, I think that it's going to be one that this generation will be talking about for years to come. Absolutely. Uh, and like you were saying, uh, uh, where, where I was, um, was in a room full of hundreds of people uh, ready to celebrate the biggest series win in in, in possibly decades. Um, and you could feel the, the tension uh, throughout that game, even though we had a commanding lead in the series, there was a lot of um, consternation about goaltending and, and, you know, can Duncan Keith, you know, not uh, have a huge blunder that uh, would cost us uh, uh, in a key moment. And the fact that we allowed nine goals in game one was a bit of a mental hurdle, I think for a lot of fans, but, um, you got to give them full credit for rallying after that and and not wilting. I think the fact that they came back and tied the game 6-6 really did a lot for their confidence, too. Now, the Oilers did still allow three unanswered goals after that, as you said, for the Flames to take a 9-6 win. But still, just to show that they, they had the ability to beat this team, and obviously they came out and... Uh, won game two in their building from that point on the, the Oilers really controlled the series absolutely I, I think that was um that was a strong statement against what was if I recall correctly the best even strength team in the NHL it was either Calgary or Carolina um yeah the line had uh, three 40 goal scorers who between the three of them averaged about 99 or, or 100 points um, it was really difficult to poke holes in the Flames game. And to be perfectly honest, I, I wasn't sure that the Oilers would, would win the series. In fact, um, I don't think any official outlet picked Edmonton to win. So they were, I wouldn't want to say overwhelming underdogs, but Calgary was the consensus pick to win the series. They were, yeah. And I, I mean, I'll be honest, going into that series, I still thought the Oilers had a good chance to win, but you, you could see it coming if they if they would have lost how how devastating it would have been and uh, i'm sure that flames fans are have been feeling that probably for the last eight months or so now too uh going into that did you think that 
the Oilers would win or, or, and even did you think that it would be as quick of a series as it was? Because I think even the most optimistic Oilers fan didn't see the Oilers winning in five games. <laughs> you know, I think a lot of Oilers fans maybe have, have a bit of a revisionist history when it comes to that. I was very nervous. Um, a lot of that does have to do with the emotional baggage of it's Calgary, right? And losing yeah. that, losing the, the battle of Alberta on either side would be just devastating, especially for the way the two teams are constructed. They're both good at the same time. Um, uh, the players on both sides have such animosity for each other. This is coming off of the heels of, you know, uh, uh, the uh, the Mike Smith uh, goalie fight game, you know, a couple years prior. It that really like this... reinvigorated the rivalry, too. And in, in, uh, I guess that would have been January 2020. Yeah, and then the pandemic happened. Um, but then right when, you know, we seem to be rebounding, uh, the rivalry picked up right where it left off. Um, so, yep. yeah, I, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. I I, I did, uh, if I had to, you know, have some truth serum, I, I did think that Calgary would win the series. I wasn't sure how close it was going to be. Um, it was just very difficult for me knowing how the playoffs uh, change and special teams is less of a factor. Physicality goes up. Defense is more disproportionately rewarded. Uh, Calgary was the best even strength team. I just, it was really hard for me to imagine a scenario where the Oilers could win. And I couldn't have imagined that Leon Dreisaitl would set an NHL record for the most points ever in a five game series, which I mean, I feel bad for doubting him, but that was a performance that you can't just bank on. That was that was otherworldly. I mean, go down the list. McDavid set multiple records during that playoff run. Dreisaitl, like you said, also set uh, a couple records. The That one for most points in a playoff series and also most assists in a playoff period. Uh, McDavid also had the most uh, multi-point games in a playoff series. They they had the type of runs that we haven't seen since the 1980s and in the Oilers heyday. And aside from that, you look at a guy like Zach Hyman, he also set an Oilers record for most consecutive games with a goal in a playoff series with five. I just go even Evander Kane, who scored a playoff hat trick, the four best players in that series were the four players I just named. Absolutely. Um, and even this season, uh, you know, if the Orvis are going to score a goal, it's usually those top four guys, five now, with Nugent Hopkins uh, having a career season. He um, scored a big goal, too, in that series. Let's not forget the game winner in game four after the Oilers had taken a 3 nothing lead. The Flames had come all the way back to tie the game, and then he gets the game winner with about three and a half minutes left on the clock. I had the privilege of being at, uh, at game four in Edmonton. Um, it, it, <laughs> I've never been to a game live that had an atmosphere of more elation, tension, just all the emotions you could imagine. Yeah. Um, the, the confusion, uh, on the Mike Smith, uh, Rasmus Anderson, 175 foot floater. I couldn't believe it. I didn't it, even realize that was, it went in when I was watching it on TV. I, I we were stunned the entire building. You could hear a pin drop. And just the emotional highs and lows of that game in particular, never mind the series, but the way Nugent Hopkins opened the scoring on a gaffe by Markstrom and then the way he scored the game-winning goal in, uh, in the dying minutes of the third period, it, it, was, it was unbelievable to behold. Uh, it was a, what, a, what a game and, and what a series. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of rambling here, but to go back to your original question, um, how did I feel going into that series? Well, I can tell you that watching Game 7 against uh, Dallas, when Johnny Gaudreau won the series in overtime, I, I really was holding out hope that Jake Ottinger would pull off a miracle because the Flames were all over them. I have no idea how that got to seven, but in my mind, there was uh, a sense of panic. I, I just, I was dumbfounded that Calgary won the series. The level of anticipation and nervousness, I, I've never felt that uh, before or since. Yeah, and I believe you and I talked about this on the podcast last May, but even though everyone in the province seemed to be thrilled about the opportunity to watch the Oilers and Flames go at it in the playoffs, 
I still was hoping that Dallas was going to win for a couple of reasons. First of all, I never cheer for the Flames in any scenario. So even if it's going to lead up to a a battle of Alberta in the playoffs, I would still rather see the Flames lose. And secondly, I thought it would be cool to have a rematch against Dallas 20 years later. That was the Oilers' biggest rival for a six- or seven-year period there in the late 90s and early 2000s, with the Oilers only coming out on top one time. And I, I just thought the the chance to play them again and get a little redemption all these years later would, would be a cool story, too. I felt the same way. Um, and just the fear of Calgary beating us was was enough. But yeah, well, that's what I I'm think saying. I mean, some redemption I, would be great. Yeah. And I don't know if you saw this, but I saw Flames fans on Twitter tweeting. This is why I didn't want to play Edmonton. Losing to them in the playoffs is the worst possible scenario. I would have rather play anyone else. So it's almost like they would have they they didn't want to play the Oilers out of the fear. It, it's like the the chance of adulation for winning wasn't worth the risk of losing. Oh, absolutely. The fear of losing a playoff series to them far outweighs uh, you know the, the rewards of winning. However, in hindsight, seeing how the Oilers won, in that building with, uh, I want to say, at least 45% Oilers fans in attendance. Uh, yeah, I, I was I was ill-prepared for that level of satisfaction. <laughs> and if you remember, uh, in 2006, when the Oilers uh, beat the President's Trophy Detroit, the President's Trophy winning Detroit Red Wings in the first round, if the Flames would have beat the Anaheim Ducks in their first round series, we would have had a Battle of Alberta that year as well. And um, it just took another uh, 16 years for it to happen, but we finally got it, and uh, thankfully for for us, the the good guys won. Oh, absolutely! <laughs> and uh, speaking of the Battle of, of Alberta, it was officially announced last month that the Oilers will host the 2023 Heritage Classic in October at Commonwealth Stadium against the Flames. It will be the Oilers' third outdoor game in the NHL and second in Edmonton as they hosted the inaugural Heritage Classic 20 years ago. There will also be an alumni game prior to the regular season game. Uh, And I believe it was Jason Greger who reported that the Oilers alumni will feature more players from the late 90s and early 2000s than their dynasty teams from the 1980s. Uh, First, I just want to ask, are you planning to go to the Heritage Classic? And secondly, which players from your childhood are you most excited to see play in the alumni game? Uh, I am planning on going. Uh, that's contingent on whether or not I'll have to take out a loan in order to go. <laughs> um, it, it'll be the hottest ticket in town. Um, you know, that goes without saying, but um, I, I have a limit. Um, but yeah, I will do everything in my power and within reason to try to go to the game. Uh, in terms of who I'm excited to see, as you recall from our our last podcast, mm-hmm. uh, it's it's obviously Alish. Um, uh, you know, I I really would like to see him in Edmonton more often. Uh, he was at that uh, Oilers Flames alumni event in I want to say Lloyd Minster. It was in Lloyd Minster, yeah, over the summer, and they had an alumni game there. Um, and I, I bet he can still play. You know, he's he's still young. Yeah, um, he would be. F- 39 right now he tur- he he'll turn 40 this summer yeah he, he's he up retired a bit young injuries were definitely a factor in his career um and then ryan smith obviously who i imagine will he has to wear the c in the game um and then the trio of american-born oilers players from the 90s who are in front office roles bill Guerin, um uh, doug wait and uh, his name is escaping me, uh, the, the GM of the San Jose Sharks, uh, Mike Greer. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I'm definitely planning to go to, and uh, I went to the Heritage Classic in 2016 in Winnipeg, where the Oilers shut out the Jets 3 nothing, and that was one of the most memorable hockey trips of my life, especially because I had the chance to see my ultimate hero, Wayne Gretzky, play live for the first and probably only time in my life. But Getting to see the Oilers play in an outdoor game at Commonwealth Stadium with the home fans cheering them on would be another awesome experience. Um, And Winnipeg did a fantastic job of hosting, too. And and the weather was pretty good because it was late October, so I think it was about plus five for both games. And uh, 
like I said, as for the players I'm, I'm most excited to see, Ryan Smith would still be near the top of the list. He played in the, the last alumni game as well. And another thing that I think would be cool is he was a, a player in the original Heritage Classic 20 years ago. So to come back all these years later and now be on the alumni team would be awesome. And uh, Alish Hemsky would be a close second. You know, I'm I'm a huge Hemsky fan, just like you. And I also think it would be cool to see some guys like Doug Waite, Anson Carter, and Bill Guerin lace them up again. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the list goes on. Todd Marchand, maybe Jarrett Stoll is available. Dwayne Rollison could be there. Um, Tommy Sallow, who is, uh, as as we've heard, the last Oilers goaltender to be at the All-Star game, but we'll get to that later. Um, yeah, I, there there aren't really too many guys I'm I'm not excited to see. I do wonder if there's any possibility that this could be used as an olive branch to bury the hatchet with Chris Pronger. And you know what? You kind of beat me to it because I was going to ask you that. What do you think of the chances are that Chris Pronger would play in the game? Now, he could have played in 2016. He was retired by then as well. But I think it would be cool to see him come back and play if he was willing to do it. I don't know how close 2016 was to the um, uh, medical issues he had post-career, because I know there was some pretty serious stuff with concussions and and whatnot. He had an Um, eye injury, too, I believe, that kind of ended his career in 2011. Yeah, so A, if he's um, healthy enough to do it is is the most important thing. Um, If that is the case, I want to say there's at least a 30% chance that that could happen. I think that would be something that... uh, is a storyline that I would like to see, and that would also be uh, therapeutic, let's say, for for Oilers fans to finally have some closure with that. Yeah, and uh, I think it, it would be cool. I think he would still get a pretty good applause. I mean, look, the Oilers don't make it to the 2006 Stanley Cup final without Chris Pronger. Despite how things ended with his time in Edmonton, if I ever had the chance to meet him, I would shake his hand and say thank you for everything because... Uh, he was the best player on that team. Alish Hemsky was the leading scorer on the Oilers in t- 2006, but there was no question. Chris Pronger was the best t- player on the team. Uh, even as, as important as Dwayne Rollison was playing uh, outstanding in goal during that run and Fernando Pisani playing the best two months of hockey of his entire life, Chris Pronger was the the guy that stirred the drink for that group. Absolutely. I mean, he's in my opinion, he's a top 10 defenseman to ever play the game. And we were privileged to have yeah. him in, uh, in, his, in prime. his prime for a season. Yeah. I, uh, one last thing on the alumni. Uh, the Oilers used a different goaltender for all three periods in the 2016 uh, alumni game. Uh, Bill Ranford played the first period. I believe it was Curtis Joseph for the second period and Dwayne Rollison for the third. Any idea who the Oilers might bring out there as the, the three goalies this time? Well, Rollison is, seems to defy age uh, with how late he played into his into his late 30s, early 40s. Um, so I think that coupled with the fact that he is an alumni darling of late, uh, he's got to be there. Um, I didn't I hadn't considered that there might be three. I was choosing between Cujo and Tommy Sallow. And I kind of leaned towards Sallow just because I believe he had uh, more games played and more seasons in Edmonton, but uh, Curtis Joseph is maybe slightly more revered, but if you can go all three, I think uh, those are the names that I would select. And and you know what? Those could be the three. Uh, The only thing is all three of those guys are in their 50s now, and I wonder if they do bring one younger goalie. Not that the the outcome of the alumni game is the biggest deal in the world. Like of, of course we want the Oilers to win. I don't know how much strategy they're putting into their uh their uh selections here. I think it's more of which guys uh, can make it at any given time. Like Steve Steos who just rejoined the organization as an assistant to the general manager. Like he'll be on the blue line for sure. Uh maybe we see Jason Smith out there as well. But um, in goal, I wonder if even a guy like Devin Dubnik would play just because he's a little bit younger. Um, he could. Um, I'm not sure if uh, maybe all all wounds are healed between uh, he and the organization. But uh, what, what do I know? Um, he was just recently on Oilers Nation. And, uh, he does have some reference for Oilers fans. So I think that would be good as well. Um, I, think, I think it's a safe bet we won't see Nikolai Habibul in there. 
Yeah, I, I think that's that's a pretty good bet. <laughs> Probably the uh, same for Breeze Golov as well. But like you were saying, a lot of the uh, dynasty guys have aged out. And I think, you know, maybe 50 years old is is still ripe uh, for someone in an alumni game. So um, I'm not really sure they're going to bring in a goalie who's played for the team uh, in the 2010s or late 2000s. Um, but I would be open to it. The other thing is, and and like I said, Gregor didn't say that it was going to be, that there would be no 80s players there. He just said it was going to be primarily players from the late 90s and early 2000s. I still think they will put the invite out to some of the legends from the 80s. The one that I think will still be at the top of everyone's list is Wayne Gretzky. And look, his birthday is two days from now. He turns 62 the last alumni game he played in was actually for the St. Louis Blues a couple months after uh, the game he played for the Oilers. So that would have been January of 2017, so uh, six years ago. And now that he's, you know, he's basically never really wanted to participate in old timers games in the first place. The the only times that he's ever played in alumni games were the the two with the Oilers and one with the Blues. I I think that they still will ask him and maybe he'll just be there as an ambassador and he'll drop the puck before the game, but won't actually lace up his skates. I I still think it would be cool if he played one last game in Edmonton and and just sort of said, you know, that's it. This is the, this is the final chapter for me as a, as a hockey player. I mean, 62, you said that that's yeah. Um, I would like to see it. I, I don't know um, uh, how much that would um, put a bit of a damper on on an, a Smith-led Oiler team versus an Aginla-led Flames team, which yeah. could be actually quite a competitive alumni game. I think so. I'm not sure what I, what uh, what I would value more: uh, a game that actually has uh, some jam and some stakes, or one that um, gives us a last goodbye to uh, those '80s Oilers. Right. And and I can tell you in the 2016 Heritage Classic alumni game, Wayne Gretzky, as as great as it was for me to see, like I said, my hero for probably the only time live in my life, he wasn't one of the best players on the ice because he doesn't skate really anymore. He skates once a year at his fantasy camps in, in the summer, and I don't think he's even done that during the pandemic. So it's it's not like he's on the ice all the time. Mark Messier at age 55 in the last uh, alumni game looked great out there. He's Paul, still a specimen. Yes. Paul Coffey. I, I, I remember joking at the time that he looked like he could still help the Oilers blue line in 2016, the way he was skating. So uh, <laughs> I, I wonder if those two uh, might still be there, especially with Paul Coffey being another guy who's back working for the organization now. It wouldn't shock me at all if, if he's out there. Um, but we might just see Gretzky, like I said, as, as doing some sort of ceremonial puck drop. Yeah, I'm along the same lines as you. I, I don't see it happening, um, but I, he'll be involved in some capacity. Absolutely. Uh, if nothing else, he will be there for the event, I'm sure. Absolutely. All right. Uh, so the league unveiled the rosters for the 2023 NHL All-Star Game in Sunrise, Florida on Friday. Connor McDavid had already been named to his sixth All-Star Game earlier this month, and McDavid will be joined by Leon Dreisaitl, who is set to play in his fourth All-Star Game, and Stuart Skinner, who will be making his All-Star Game debut. I want to get your thoughts on all three of them through 48 games this season. So let's start with McDavid. To no one's surprise, McDavid leads the league in goals, assists, and points. He's just 12 points shy of reaching the 100-point plateau, and we're still in January. He's on pace to become the first player to record 150 points in a single season since Mario Lemieux in 1995-96, which was a year before McDavid was even born. And currently, he has a 22-point lead in the scoring race over his next closest non-teammate. McDavid scored his 40th goal of the season in a 4-2 win over the Vancouver Canucks on Saturday, becoming the fastest player to score 40 goals in a single season since Pavel Bury in 1999-2000. Post, after reaching new scoring heights in the 2022 playoffs, McDavid has somehow found another gear this season, hasn't he? Uh, I'm running out of superlatives. I don't know how to <laughs> how to describe what we're witnessing. Um, 
yeah, I mean, obviously he's he's going to be uh, the marquee attraction at any event the NHL has, whether it's an All Star game or uh, some kind of an ambassador thing or the the fun clips they do at uh, NHL head offices uh, before preseason starts. Um, he's the as far as I'm concerned, he is the best athlete on the planet. Uh, I'm not sure how close that is uh, to see anyone dominating a sport the way he's currently dominating hockey. Um, he's deserving. Do you follow other sports as well? Just sorry to cut in for there. Like, do you follow the NFL and MLB and NBA at all? Uh, I like to keep a, a very a very loose pulse on on all sports. Um, probably everything except uh, the NFL. I would say I have some level of interest in. And if you look at those other sports, the gap between one and two doesn't seem anywhere close to what it is in hockey. Exactly. I mean, I mean, I'm not a big football fan, but I'll use an example. Uh, Joe Burrow right now is being regarded as possibly the best player in the NFL, and it's usually a quarterback. Uh, but before, uh, there was a lot of talk for Aaron Donald, a, a defensive player, and it just seems like that mantle changes season to season. Patrick Mahomes um, has been right at the top for a while now, too. Yeah, when he signed that nearly uh, half billion dollar contract, uh, he was on top of the world and uh, pay, playing Tom Brady in, in the Super Bowl uh, gained him some additional notoriety. But uh, is it him? Is it Lamar Jackson? There's there's a lot of names that seemingly are in rotation. Um, there's a debate, at least, for who the best player is, right? Absolutely. Uh, basketball has, um, you know, Luka, Luka possibly... Donkic. For, for its first time in, in history, the top three players aren't American. And um, there's a lot of consternation. But yeah, in hockey, there's there's just no question. Um, McDavid is in, is in his own tier um, by uh, such a substantial amount. And I think that a lot of people don't even realize that. Like, if you were to ask the average American sports fan, who was a more dominant athlete, Michael Jordan or Wayne Gretzky? The majority are going to say Michael Jordan just because they're more familiar with his career. But when you actually look at it, statistically, Wayne Gretzky dominated the game of hockey far more than Michael Jordan dominated the game of basketball. It's just that basketball is more of a global game, and Michael Jordan is far more famous than Wayne Gretzky is. Right. I mean, hockey is a very niche sport. Um, the NHL is, is uh, you know, let's, let's say a, a small fish in a big pond. Um, but you know, I, I don't want that to, uh, uh, to, to lessen what we're witnessing. Um, you know, the NHL is now on ESPN and I think that's, that's it a long time be. getting on ESPN and TNT, I think is one of the best things for the growth of the game in the U S absolutely. If you're not on ESPN, uh, you basically don't exist in the United States. Uh, so that's step one and seeing him on ESPN every now and again um, is, I think, really valuable for the exposure to Connor McDavid. Um, and then uh, to Leon Dreisaitl, um, you know, he's he is at worst the third best player in the NHL, in my opinion. Um, so seeing him there through a fan vote, which I'm not sure uh, how accurate uh, this fan vote is, seeing, mm -hmm. seeing as all the uh, the names we expected were there for the most part. Um, but yeah, he's obviously very uh, deserving. Um, and then lastly, Seward Skinner. Uh, he's the first Oilers goaltender at the All-Star game since Tommy Sallow. Um, I couldn't be more yeah. happy for him. And what a year he's having. He's a dad. He makes the NHL. He's a starter for a little bit. Um, it, it's been an unbelievable season for him personally. Right. And, and you know, just before I touch on the All-Stars, I want to go back to something you said a minute ago about uh, getting McDavid on ESPN from time to time. I think there was a real missed opportunity in the playoffs last year when McDavid was having his incredible run to, if not lead off sports center, have him be one of the top stories. And it seemed like if you even check ESPN's Twitter, there were nights when Connor would have a, a big game and put up three points and lead the Oilers to an impressive victory. And it really wasn't even on the radar. And I'm just like, if that type of a run won't do it, I mean, what, what will it, it almost seems like if Connor Bedard, who is going to be the first overall pick this year, were to land in Chicago or a, a major American city, he would get the attention that McDavid isn't because I think the fact that it's a Canadian superstar playing on a Canadian team works against him a little bit in the States. 
It absolutely does. Um, but I think to a, a bigger effect, why this is happening, why he's at best a, a, a tertiary story on ESPN, is the fact that the NHL is now paying for the sins of its past. Um, not being on ESPN from 2004 until 2021 or or whatever the, uh, the return date was, has an effect. And uh, that is, in my opinion, the largest reason why uh, McDavid and the, and the sport in general has relative anonymity south of the border. Um, I think Connor McDavid is important in turning the tide that maybe could set up uh, success for Bedard and others in the future. But um, uh, during McDavid's prime, uh, it, it's it's too late now to expect to uh, gain ground when you've essentially squandered two decades of building fans. There's there's a couple ways I think they could do it, though. The the first, I mean, they would obviously want McDavid to play in an American market. And as an Oilers fan, I'm, I'm hoping that he's going to spend his entire career in Edmonton. And I believe he'll spend his entire career in Edmonton. But the other alternative is to have the Oilers play a major American market in the Stanley Cup final. For instance, if the Oilers were to face the Boston Bruins in, in the final this year, that would get more eyes on McDavid than probably at any point during his career. It's funny you should mention that because I was just thinking about that today, uh, which market I would like to see the Oilers play against. Um, and Boston was a, my number one choice in terms of uh, growing the sport. It's it, Boston is the predominant sports city, uh, possibly on the planet, certainly in the United States. Um, such rich history with all four leagues. Um, championships uh legends go through that city bobby Orr, tom brady um uh you know uh, larry, larry bird, bird the list goes on um that's that's a, a franchise and a city that i think um which has history with edmonton in the stanley cup final before yeah that that, be, that's some storytelling that they could do even though it happened more than three decades ago the oilers beat the bruins in the 88 and 90 stanley cup finals and maybe the you know, the Bruins could be the uh, the Islanders for for Edmonton. You know, they go to the Stanley Cup Finals, lose. Um, probably like, may may not meet again, but uh, um, it seems like every team needs this one learning lesson. And maybe that was Colorado for us. But um, yeah. yeah, I think that would also be my my dream finals matchup is is Edmonton Boston. And that would be a great final. And, and you know what? Even though the Bruins would be, I think the heavy favorites in that series knowing how driven mcdavid and dry are the first chance that they get to play in a stanley cup final don't you just get the feeling that they're not going to waste that uh yeah i mean when uh connor is in his mode he has that i will not be denied look in his eye um yeah you, you never want to uh to set any limitations on him or leon um whether they're <laughs> healthy or not it seems like they find another level in key moments oh absolutely and i mean one thing that really separates the truly great players from the rest of the league is that they're always looking to improve and challenge themselves and since mcdavid entered the league in 2015-16 he's improved on his greatness every year down the line i mean he's he's been the most dominant offensive player in the world since his second season but this year he's focused his attention on being one of the best goal scorers in the league too. I mean, McDavid could become the first oiler to win the rocket Richard trophy since it was first awarded in 1998, 99 and the first oiler to lead the league in goals since Wayne Gretzky in 1986, 87. He's on pace for an astonishing 68 goals this year. And as we've seen throughout his career, McDavid always elevates his game down the stretch drive. So I think that he, has a real shot to become the first player in 30 years to hit the 70 goal plateau post first off. Did you ever think we would see another 70 goal scorer in the NHL? And how many goals do you predict McDavid will finish with this season? Uh, no, I, I never thought we could see 70 goals in our, in our lifetime. Uh, not while the game is still five on five and officiated the way it is. Uh, you'd have to fundamentally change it for that to happen. Yet here we are. Uh, Connor keeps redefining what is and isn't possible. Um, I think maybe a, a reason that, uh, he's on this drive to score 50, 60 goals, maybe more, um, has to do with last season. Um, it's not the fact that Austin Matthews won the Hart trophy 
and the uh, and the Ted Lindsay. It's the fact that he won them by so much. Um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I believe uh, McDavid had was it fewer than 30 first place MVP votes yeah. uh, for the Hart Trophy. That is um, staggeringly behind Austin Matthews. It, it wasn't even close. Despite finishing 17 points ahead of him in the scoring race. Um, it's inexplicable. I'm not really sure how that happens. Um, I understand scoring 60 goals is a feat that's so rare that it needs to be recognized. Um, but to be leaps and bounds behind Austin Matthews in uh, in MVP voting, I think was, uh, let's call it uh, motivation for Connor. Um, and then the Ted Lindsay as well, which in my opinion is... That was the, the more, one that I was really shocked that he didn't get i thought that austin matthews might get the heart i was surprised that connor didn't win the ted Lindsay award though um i think the heart as it used to be known as the lesser b pearson um had a lot of cachet and value and i i don't believe it does anymore just because of the asterisks around the award such as well you kind of have to make the playoffs and you can't have a teammate that's also top 10 in scoring and um i do believe that um the simplicity of the definition of the Ted Lindsay makes it the true MVP award um, over the Hart Trophy, actually. And that's most the one outstanding I was player with. as voted by the Players Association. Yes. Most Whereas outstanding player, period. And there is all every year the writers are looking for a new story, like the year that Taylor Hall uh, got the Devils into the playoffs. You know, it's it seems like there's a little bit of voter fatigue setting in for McDavid already, which is really disappointing that you have one of the greatest players of all time in his prime. And you're looking for reasons to give the MVP to anyone else when realistically he should win it every year. If McDavid had, you know, even 20 or 30% of uh, heart votes, I don't think he would be uh, as insulted maybe is the wrong word, but I think that there is a, a an internal disrespect that maybe was was done, and uh, we're now seeing a result of that. And I don't know if you heard the interview that Leon Dreisaitl did with Elliot Friedman uh, before the season where uh, Leon told Elliot that he, in his talks with Connor over the summer, he told him, you know, you should score 60 goals every year. And Leon says, I, I know that you could, but you're so unselfish. And now here he is this year kind of saying, well, you know what? Yeah, I think I can score 60 goals, and I'm going to, I'm going to prove it this year. Yeah, I, I think Connor is one of those few players whose point total um, is decided by um, his will. Um, if he wants to score 60 goals, he can. If he wants to score 150 points, he can. Um, but he's the kind of guy who will defer and try to get teammates going. Yep. Um, not to say that he isn't doing that this season, but I just think his assertiveness is maybe catching teams by surprise. And that really opens up the Oilers' offense because now – uh, the defender can't just cheat to the side to take away the pass. He he has to stay somewhat in the middle to uh, b- because McDavid is such a threat to shoot now. And that's either going to open up more backdoor passes for McDavid or it's going to create a, a maybe a couple extra inches over the goalie's shoulder where he can snipe. Absolutely. I, I don't think we can uh, have it lost on us that now we have uh, Evander Kane and Zach Hyman, where, whereas before that was a rotating cast of guys who had probably never scored 20 goals in their entire career. Um, so having more offensive weapons and options available to him, (coughs) excuse me, uh, and a historic power play, uh, are things that, uh, can't be overlooked as well. Yeah. And I mean, I feel confident at this point that McDavid is going to win the rocket. Uh, but now that we're into the second half of the season and he's still on pace for nearly 70 goals, I have to think he does it. And even though he's probably always going to be a pass first guy, I love that he's starting to be a bit more selfish and using his lightning quick shot when he's in a prime scoring position. And while McDavid is having a historically great season, we can't forget that Dreisaitl is having a career year as well. I mean, Dreisaitl ranks second in the league in points, fourth in assists, and 10th in goals. He's on pace for 50 goals and 130 points. So we could see the first two players of the 21st century to record 130 points in the same season. And they both play for the Edmonton Oilers. Post, do you think Dreisaitl might be the most underappreciated superstar in the league? Um, that's a difficult question. Um, I, I'm not sure that he is the most underappreciated, but um, there is a sense of that. Um, seeing as he does play with Connor, 
Um, but the fact that he has his his Ted Lindsay, his uh, Art Ross in his heart, um, that does make that a, a bit more of a, of a difficult ask. Um, uh, I guess it depends on on the narrative at the time. Um, uh, he's been called a power play merchant uh, by some. I, I've seen that online, but I think that's a little more um, uh, in jest. Um, uh, I, I, yeah, I, I would say no. Um, I think people know how good he is. Um, but, uh, in some sense, they don't quite know the, uh, the potential that he has. Um, I think if he was on any other team, um, he would have, you know, the, the Evgeny Malkin effect, but, uh, I think he's perfectly fine with his situation as is. And, um, we, we know how good he is here in Edmonton. Yeah, and I'm not sure how much he's concerned with it, but I think he's been a top five player in the league for the past five seasons. And and personally, I believe he is the second best player in the world. But just like Evgeny Malkin, who you mentioned, who has been overshadowed by Sidney Crosby for his entire career in Pittsburgh, Dreisaitl doesn't get even close to the, the attention he deserves because he plays on the same team as McDavid. Dreisaitl had 32 points in 16 playoff games last spring, one point behind McDavid, whose playoff performance was considered one for the ages. And keep in mind, Dreisaitl was playing with a high ankle sprain for most of that playoff run. So in terms of offensive production, Dreisaitl has been head and shoulders above anyone not named Connor McDavid. And he's closer to McDavid's level in that regard than he is to McKinnon. Uh, Dreisaitl is also the best passer in the league, especially on the backhand, and he's on pace to become only the sixth European-born player in NHL history to record three 50-goal seasons this year. He's also leading the league in power play goals while being one of Edmonton's top penalty killers. He wins face-offs, and he's almost impossible to separate from the puck down low. And it, it's like McDavid said a couple weeks ago, it, it wouldn't be an all-star game without Dreisaitl there. Absolutely. I, I agree. Um and not to take anything away from uh, from the All Star selection, I do think that the um, the one player per team mandate does slightly delegitimize the All Star event. It does because um, it wasn't always that way. Yeah, it it is slightly disappointing that it isn't uh, best on best. Um, but you know that's that's neither here nor there. Um, in my estimation, Leon alternates between the second and the third best player depending on how Kale McCarr is performing at the moment. But yeah, there's an argument to, to be made that he is uh, the second best player in the league. Um, I think once it's all said and done, uh, fairly or not, a lot of it will be dependent on whether or not he has a Stanley Cup um, in the eyes of the media and, and uh, people outside of Edmonton. Goes for McDavid and Dry Seidel. Yes. Uh, all right, let's talk a bit more about Stuart Skinner now. Uh, as you already said, he's the first Oilers goalie to be named to the All-Star Game since Tommy Salo in 2002. And even more impressively, Skinner is the first Oilers rookie goalie named to the All-Star Game since Grant Fear in 1982. Uh, Post, other than McDavid and Dreisaitl, do you think Skinner has been the Oilers' most important player this season? Without question. Um, I don't think there's really an argument uh, against it. Um, if he wasn't uh, on his game, at, at the level of an elite starter uh, in the first third of the season. I don't know that the Oilers are in playoff contention right now. Um, you know, I know it, it took Jack some time to get acclimated, um, and he seems to be rounding into form. Um, but we could be having a very different conversation right now if Stuart Skinner hadn't been percolating at the exact right moment uh, to take advantage of this opportunity. And I think um, this is an opportunity for me to give rare kudos to Ken Holland. Uh, who I was actually very critical of last season uh, for sending down Skinner when he did uh, after an inauspicious shutout in San Jose, which mm -hmm. got him demoted. Um, fans were irate. Um, I was one of them. But, you know, it seems that the way he's been developed um, has led him to this. And um, I think a lot of credit goes to Stu himself and uh, Ken's patience. But, um, yeah, he, he's, you know, he saved the season potentially based on his performance. So I don't think you could uh, go wrong with saying he is the team's MVP. Yeah. And as happy as I am for McDavid and Drysdale to have another all-star game appearance on their resumes, everyone who follows hockey knows that those two were going to be there, but I'm really happy for a guy like Skinner to be going. 
I mean, just think about everything that has happened in his life over the past four months. You brought up a couple of them already. He became a full-time NHL player in October for his hometown team. Uh, and then he quickly steals the starter job from Jack Campbell. He signed a three-year contract extension in December worth $7.8 million. He became a father on January 14th with the birth of his son, Bo. And then less than a week later, he's selected to the NHL All-Star Game. His save percentage is also tops among Pacific Division netminders. Post, I don't think he could have dreamed of a better rookie campaign in the NHL, could he? Well, clearly this is a Hollywood script. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, what uh, what a four or five month period. Um, yeah, you said it perfectly. It's it's an absolute dream scenario. Um, and it is really special. I, I don't think it can be lost on us that he's from Edmonton. He knows what it's like. Um, uh, and, you know, there's a lot of love for him. I, I think uh, it kind of reminds me of the opposite version of Mitch Marner, who knows what it's like to be a Leafs fan, to grow up in Toronto. And there's a lot of pressure on him. Um, but he's making world beater money. And I think for Seward Skinner to be um, a fan favorite like Marner is in Toronto, but he is on a reasonable contract. He's outperforming it. Um, there isn't a lot of uh, fan pressure on him. Um, I think that uh, that's an example of a player who understands the market, knows what's expected from the fans, and has given us a uh, a really team-friendly bargain that's only going to make things easier mentally on him and uh, and the team. Oh, for sure. And I think the other thing is, for years, the Oilers have been looking for a solution in goal. And as recently as this summer, even, they go out and they sign Jack Campbell to a five-year contract worth $25 million. Now they've got Skinner signed. So for the next three years, they have their two goaltenders locked up for a total of $7.6 million. I just think... To draft and develop your own goaltender who has now made it to the All-Star game, and he's a local kid too. What a story that is. But also, even after Campbell's time is done, and who knows how the next three to five years plays on, plays out, but just to have that guy who you can see being the Oilers goaltender for years to come, that's just a huge win for this organization to find a guy like that in the third round of the draft. It seemingly doesn't happen to the Oilers. Um, I've been very jealous over the years seeing players develop in other organizations. Um, and, I mean, you may count Devin Dubnik as the last uh, drafted, drafted and developed, developed. Yeah. goalie, but um, I would argue that he wasn't a true NHL starter at his peak in Edmonton. He was just the guy that was starting. Um, it was also during the, right in the middle of the decade of darkness, too. And he found his game and became a multi-time all-star once he got to Minnesota. But let's not forget, he bounced around to a, a few other organizations before he even landed there. Yeah, and I think he was a victim of circumstance. Um, but um, that being said, I think that prevented him from becoming a true NHL bonafide number one while he was here. Um, so I... I, I don't want to say that the last one was um, Grant Fuhr. Uh, I don't believe the Oilers drafted Bill Ranford. Um, uh, no, they traded Andy Moog for him uh, in a deal with the Boston Bruins in 1988. So depending on your definition, uh, he could be the first true drafted and developed starting goaltender since Grant Fuhr. And I, I think that's that's really special. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the Oilers drafted Andy Moog and Grant Fuhr in back-to-back -back years in uh, 80 and 81, and they went on to win multiple cups, both of them with the Oilers. And like you said, then there was basically a 35-year a period there where they were basically looking for the next guy who was going to step up and, and, and be that for this team. So to finally find it, and, and let's not forget, the Oilers traded up in uh, the 2017 draft to get him because that was a, a player that they had targeted and they wanted. And here he is six years after or coming up on six years after uh, his draft day in June of 2017. And uh, he's playing in the all-star game as an oiler. Yeah, it, it's, it's such a confluence of events. Um, we're, we're really lucky to see him do this and not to say that you have to do uh, to draft and develop a goaltender. A lot of them come by a trade, but, it's just a bit of a quirky stat that uh, this organization doesn't seem to have luck in that area until now. No. 
And look, I know the All-Star game isn't the best hockey by any means that we're going to watch all winter, but I I still watch it every year and I enjoy seeing the skills competition uh, even more. So I'm hoping McDavid will take back the fastest skater title and it'll be fun to see Dreisaitl and Skinner participate in a couple events as well. Uh, But the last thing I want to ask you about the All-Star game before we move on are the jerseys that the NHL unveiled last Friday. Uh, I, I think that they're giving real Miami Vice vibes. Uh, what are your thoughts on them? They are the best uniforms in the history of NHL All-Star Games. Uh, uh, you there's know, a little it, bit of bias there. <laughs> given I, your I profile them. picture, I, I thought that you might like those as well. I love the aesthetic of Miami Vice, <laughs> Vapor Wave. I just, I think that, uh, especially seeing those colors on an NHL uniform is yeah. is really interesting. Um I believe it's the first time pink will ever be used on a proper uniform, not including uh, warm-up jerseys. So that's right. cool. And that shade of blue, I think, is is a, a great accent for it. Uh, the only thing I don't like is the fact that the retail price is listed at, if I remember correctly, $370. Yeah. I mean, you're we're seeing authentic jerseys around the league hovering around that point. I'm sure that those numbers will come down after the All-Star game when they're trying to move out the remaining stock. And I mean, it, they're only going to be worn one Sunday ever, right? So it's, it's going to be a collector's item. But I think that let's say Skinner wins the, the all-star game MVP or dry or McDavid or something. People might want the Jersey for that reason, but uh, it's cool to look at. I don't know if I see myself uh, buying one. I am a Jersey collector, but I, I don't know if I'm going to go out and grab that one. But uh, uh, if there, if there was some really historic moment with an Oilers player wearing it, I would consider it. Well, I have nearly a hundred jerseys. Um, none of them oh, are yeah. all-star I think, games. I think you're, you might even be ahead of me. I, I'm probably in the 75 range, I, I think, all sports considered. But um, I, the only all-star jersey I have is a Campbell Conference Gretzky jersey from the 80s. Oh, that that would be uh, something I would pay uh, an embarrassing amount, <laughs> amount of money for. But um, I think when push comes to shove, it's one of my shove, favorites. I, I will get uh, this all-star jersey, but uh, I'm going to grit my teeth when I do <laughs> Yeah, the the pink and turquoise is really cool. And I think the only other hockey team that I can ever remember wearing pink on a jersey was not even in the NHL, but it was the Calgary Hitmen in the WHL. And that obviously is a tie into their former owner, Brett the Hitman Hart, from his WWF days. I mean, maybe the Orlando Solar Bears did something, but that's just a guess. Yeah, I could see that too. And I think the NBA All-Star jerseys a few years ago when it was in Miami had a, a similar color scheme as well. I mean, not to go too far off off track here, but I think the NBA really does um, some interesting things with their uniforms. Um, the fact that they have most teams will have four, five, possibly six jerseys in rotation right. at once. The NHL is slowly trending in that direction with the reverse retro program. Um, but change is slow, especially for a league as um, conservative as the NHL. But I love seeing uh, this. Uh, surge and uniform creativity of late and you know we didn't talk about this earlier but there's reportedly uh going to be a a completely new oilers jersey for the heritage classic next fall and uh, it could be a, a tie into the uh 1952 edmonton mercuries who competed in the the winter olympics that year so we might see an out of the box kind of idea there but i was still sort of hoping that for that alumni game, the Oilers would wear the original copper and blue uniforms that they wore from 1996 until 2007. My assumption, just based on the two teams involved, was that we would see the 06 Cup Run jersey and the 04 Cup Run jersey. That would be cool. Um, especially with, you know, like I said previously, I would assume it'll be the Ryan Smith captain Oilers versus the Jerome McGinley captaining uh, the Calgary Flames and and what better jerseys to commemorate the event. Um, but you know what? That being said, I'm not married to that idea. If they want to go a little bit off the board, I think that's interesting too, coming from a collector's perspective. Um, but just to give credit, I believe it was uh, uh, Tyler Uremchuk of Winners Nation. Another, yeah, yeah. So he he had uh, some insider information about that. Um, there would be some slight adjustments to the 
Edmonton. Uh, what was the name again? The Mercury's. The Mercury's, yeah, I think was a team uh, in the 1950s in town. Um, and there is a outline of a maple leaf, which I think would be replaced by the silhouette of an oil drop and um, an arch to Mercury's font replaced with uh, an Oilers word mark. Um, but a pretty faithful adaptation uh, from what I from what I gather. Um, I, I would like to see something like that just for fun. But I would hope that Calgary would also find something in their historical archive to match. Yeah, and that team in in '52 from Edmonton was the last Canadian squad to win gold at the Olympics until Mario Lemieux and Team Canada in 2002 in Salt Lake City. So there was a 50-year span there where Canada didn't win gold, largely due to the fact that the Winter Olympics didn't allow NHL participation during that time. I think you can assume that if NHL players were allowed to play, they would have given the Soviet Union uh, a a tougher test than uh, some of the other countries were over that period of time. We missed out on some great hockey then. <laughs> and I guess the other thing, too, now that I'm thinking of the Heritage Classic, I'll ask you one last thing on it. Uh, I, I know that I said that, well, obviously the regular season game is going to be the one that, you know, you want to win the most. But going into that alumni game the day before, if it's the Saturday afternoon, I think that people will still be going into it. You know, that it, it's like a fun afternoon, getting to see some some old players from uh, our younger years. and. I have a feeling that by the time we get halfway through the second period, if it's a 3-3 tie, it's going to get a lot more intense. Yeah, I, I could see that happening. Um, I do favor the Oilers for the regular season game, but I, something tells me the Flames will have the upper hand in the alumni game. And it seems to go that way for a lot of the outdoor games where the team that wins the alumni game doesn't win the regular season game it happened uh in edmonton in 2003 where the oilers legends beat the habs legends and then the canadians beat the oilers in the regular season game and same thing in 2016 where uh winnipeg's alumni beat the oilers alumni and then the oilers beat the jets in the actual regular season game yeah that's a bit of a coincidence um but i also tried to forecast the flames team okay you're you're thinking they're going to have a pretty good roster. I mean, obviously, Jerome looks, he could probably still play. Uh, <laughs> um, maybe, Kiprasov uh, and goal. Oh, yeah, that's a given. Kiprasov will be there. Uh, I'm assuming uh, Jamie Noodles McClellan will will make an appearance. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, Robin Regeer, maybe. Um, He's an Edmonton Lankow. guy, too. So I think having the chance to play for the, as you know, a Flames alumni in his hometown of Edmonton, I, I think that, yeah, he probably would be there. I think, yeah, he will. We'll see, uh, let's say, a Rennie Bork, um, a Curtis Glencross. I think uh, a lot of those guys are probably still in good game shape. Wait, is Glencross playing for the Oilers or Flames? Oh, he'll be a <laughs> Flame for sure. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, although in the 2016 uh, alumni game, Willie Lindstrom switched teams halfway through. He played uh, for the Oilers in the first two periods, and then he played for the Jets in the third period. Oh, that's something to keep an eye on. That's, yeah, so that's fascinating. I, I don't think that uh, Glenn Cross is as attached to the Oilers as the Flames, though. So I, I have a feeling that uh, he'll just be suiting up for the uh, the visitors in that one. Well, as long as Steve Stales doesn't turn coat halfway through, I'll survive. I, I don't think so, especially since he's a an employee of the Oilers organization. I doubt that's happening now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so the Oilers extended their winning streak to a season long six games with a 4 2 victory over the Vancouver Canucks on Saturday. That also equals the longest winning streak in the McDavid era. Post, in what areas have you seen the Oilers improve over the past two weeks that has allowed them to win six straight games? Uh, it's Olivier Darnay. No. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, hey, he's I undefeated in the NHL. A, a bigger commitment to team defense. Um, and that's something that they talk about. Um, I see them, uh, you know, McDavid, Dreisaitl, Nuge, they seem really frustrated in post-game press conferences after uh, tough defensive performances. They know what they have to do. They know what the weaknesses are. But I think that executing that has proved really difficult for this team as it's currently constructed, uh, no matter how hard they try. Um, I don't know what it is. Um, they, they are constantly working at it, um, and it just seems to have... Uh, unpredictable ebbs and flows the way the defensive um, structure just seemingly comes and goes. Um, I can't explain it. Uh, McDavid has had exasperated moments in pressers where he can't explain it. Um, 
we seem to be on a defensive heater right now. Um, I, I, I really don't know. Um, obviously, this is a soft patch in the schedule. Um, but to have those character wins, like in Vegas, where you shut things down in the third, where you know maybe we'd, we would expect the team to wilt. Um, there are some statement games that they've had of late, um, coupled with taking care of business against teams that they should beat. Um, those two wins against uh, San Jose and Anaheim came at a time where um, Oilers fans were wondering, is the season on the line? Are we going to miss the playoffs? And then here we are talking about catching Vegas for the division title. Um, so to summarize, uh, team defense, um, scheduled wins, let's say, in, in a soft uh, part of January, um, and maybe a little bit of luck and goaltending. I think it's just the, the right mix at the right time. Yeah, I'm with you there. I mean, this winning streak really couldn't have come at a better time for the Oilers. Two weeks ago, they were barely clinging to the final wildcard spot in the Western Conference. But thanks to a six-game heater, the Oilers are now just three points back of the Vegas Golden Knights for top spot in the Pacific Division with 34 games to play this season. And while McDavid and Dreisaitl continue to drive the bus offensively, Edmonton is getting contributions from several forwards. Zach Hyman leads the Oilers in scoring during their win streak with 11 points in six games. Ryan Nugent Hopkins has nine points during the streak. And I think Hyman and Nugent Hopkins should be headed to the All-Star game too, by the way. You mentioned that if players were just going to go on merit uh, and every team didn't have to have a representative there, uh, guys like Hyman and Nugent Hopkins would go for sure. Clem Costin even has four goals in the past six games. I mean, just how great of a find has he been for this club? That was a a trade that really was under the radar back in November. It was seen as like a minor league exchange, and he's come up and been such a valuable piece for this team. The Oilers have also been much better defensively as of late. They're averaging just 2.17 goals against per game during their winning streak. The penalty kill has also gone from 29th in the league through the first 42 games to 5th in the league over the past six contests. So if the Oilers can continue to do a decent job of keeping the puck out of their net, they will be a dangerous team down the stretch and into the playoffs. Uh, Yeah, I mean, just like you said, um, those aspects on the defensive side of the puck have to be, um, you know, up to snuff. Um, I think a game that really gave me hope was uh, on January 5th against the Islanders, where they had um, what I believe was their best overall game of the season. Uh, The most entertaining game was uh, the Tampa 5-3 win, but I think uh, the Oilers had something like a a 20 to to 3 even strength uh, scoring chance advantage against the Islanders. Uh, they completely shut that game down and then they went for a bit of a dip. Um, and then they, they went on a six game winning streak. Um, they can do it. It's just a little bit unpredictable when they're, when they're going to. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a big thing. Like just having the consistent consistency and the Oilers really have a great opportunity to keep banking points as the strength of their schedule won't be nearly as difficult over the next month. In fact, uh, their game against the Canucks over the weekend was their first of eight straight against bottom 10 teams in the league. They'll play the Blue Jackets, the Blackhawks, the Flyers, the Senators, the Canadians, and twice against the Red Wings. And with a win over the Blue Jackets tomorrow night, the Oilers would record their first seven-game winning streak since March of 2002, so nearly 21 years. Now, we have seen the Oilers play down to their competition in the past, but they've taken care of business recently and beaten the teams they should beat. Post, with a lighter schedule coming up and the team playing its best hockey all season, how long do you think they can keep this streak going, and where do you think the Oilers will finish in the Pacific Division? Oh, that's a difficult question to answer. Um, I flip-flopped a lot uh, from the game at LA to today where I thought, you know, maybe there's a 50-50 chance they even qualify for the playoffs to now uh, thinking division. Um, uh, ultimately, I think the Oilers probably finish second. Um, Vegas is too good of a team going through a lull right now. Um, but that's okay, you know, because I think that if we play maybe LA or Seattle in the first round, that isn't the end of the world. Um, um, but yeah, I think they have uh, they have the team depth right now uh, to to weather the storm and at least get into the playoffs. And like you were talking about, Clean Cost and who I'd like to point out has as many goals as Jonathan Huberto. Um, he's been one of the best <laughs> trades of the season. 
uh, you know, not that I keep uh, a, a big pulse uh, on on the Eastern Conference as, as much as the West, but I, I don't know that a trade in season has made a bigger impact uh, than he has. So you got to give great credit to Ken Holland, who I know is uh, a little maligned uh, in the market at times, but um, for a guy on defense who probably would have never cracked the roster to someone who is now at worst a third line winger. Uh, who could move up and down the lineup and give you a physical element is unbelievable value. Yeah, we've seen some guys come into this team recently that no one would have anticipated a few months ago. I mean, Clem Costin wasn't even on the team when the season started, but to think that they would find a guy who just couldn't seem to make it work in St. Louis and all of a sudden a change of scenery and everything clicks. And there was a stretch there where he had more goals over a 10-game period than McDavid did. And it just, it seemed like you've got, you've got this guy who can score a little bit. He's big and strong and is willing to drop the gloves. He hits hard. This is the, exactly the type of player that the Oilers have needed for a long time. I, I couldn't agree more. And uh, I think uh, something that I missed when you were talking about what has been the reason for the Oilers' rapid improvement um, is I think team toughness, which is sometimes underrated. Um, I don't want to call the Oilers soft by any means, but um, they've been very easy to push around. Um, they did lose some toughness with Cassian going out over the summer for sure. They did. And obviously Cassian is someone who probably shouldn't fight anymore um, for health reasons. But um, yeah, I, I look at a guy like, like Costin and um, he makes players around him play bigger. Um, him and De- DeHarnay coming in at, at roughly the yeah. same time. Uh, it just it can't be overstated how much that changes the the dynamic of the team. Um, whereas uh, before the game in Los Angeles, I want to say the Oilers had maybe three fights on the season, and they doubled that in one night. Yeah, I, I think this month they've they've had at least four fights. I would say this month, and and Costin, I mean, his he's willing to drop the gloves with anyone. There was the the fight against even like we said Cassian earlier this season, um, but more recently fought another former Oiler and Patrick Maroon and held his own in that one too. And when Evander Kane is able to fight again, which I don't know what that'll be, there seems to be a bit of internal uh, governor on anything like that. I think there's a time that he has to wait until he can fight, obviously because, you know, even, even though it was his, his left wrist that was cut still uh, getting in a scrap uh, just, a couple months after a, a major injury like that, you you don't want to risk that, especially when the playoffs are just around the corner and that's the most important thing right now. Exactly. Um, but yeah, when, when he is back in action in that sense, um, that gives us a dynamic that I think um, is, is enough to get by between him, Vinny, uh, and obviously Darnell is probably our best fighter, but you know, he, uh, he can't be doing that. He's too important. He has to be on the ice. Exactly. Earlier in his career, he fought a lot more. But now, you know, with how heavily he's relied on on the left side of the blue line, to have him spending five minutes in the penalty box at a time, it, that's that's hard to take him off the ice for that period of time. And, and I think that the Lightning kind of sucked him into doing that on uh, their, their game last week where Corey Perry, who's a fourth-line winger, um, got Darnell to fight and really didn't even throw a single punch. He just wanted to uh, get Darnell out of the game and, and allow his team to get back in it. Yeah, exactly. And that's the kind of gamesmanship that I think the others have lacked. Um, I just, I can't overstate how, how refreshing it is to see this team uh, fight for each other. Yeah. Um, not just accept, um, you know, gutless plays and, and then move on. And I think that was really demoralizing at times when let's say you're, you're Kyler Yamamoto and you get rubbed out in the boards and there really isn't anyone there to answer the bell for you. Uh, it really brings a team together to have this all for one and one for all mentality. Yeah. And they still have to pick their moments, right? Like if it's a three, three tie and there's 10 minutes left in the third period and someone kind of takes a cheap shot against McDavid, you want to see your team stick up for the captain and, and the best player on the team, but you also have to be smart about it and say, are we really going to take a penalty right now and give the opportunity to the other team on the power play when uh, we're that close to getting a point in the standings? And when it's th- as tight as it is, to potentially take a regulation loss instead of 
either having a chance to win or at, at least extend it to overtime, you have to just sort of pick your moments, I think. And I think this was really exemplified uh, roughly a month ago at a game I was at, um, the final Battle of Alberta of the season in the Saddle Dome. And there was one play in particular where I believe it was Mackenzie Weger went knee on knee with McDavid. That and was, was a, a great example of basically exactly what I'm talking about. Right. Uh, the Oilers won the game 2-1. It was a bit of a nail biter. They were thoroughly outplayed from start to finish by the Calgary Flames. Um, but a big reason why they won the game is they didn't retaliate on that. And Connor McDavid scored a power play goal. They won the game. Yep. But um, I think in the grand scheme of things, if that's going to be the standard, uh, this team isn't going to win very much. Um, it was the talk of the town for the next week or two afterwards is that I guess you can just do whatever you want to the best athlete on the planet without any repercussions. No one so much as looked in Uyghur's direction for the rest of the game. Um, that gave me a bit of panic, um, which is why I'm just so happy to see how this team has changed in uh, in recent weeks. Yeah, and if the game would have been 3-1 at that time, I would have liked someone to step up more. And, and maybe even in that scenario, when you're leading 2-1, you still do something about it. But I think it's almost better to just take a number and remember that down the road. I, I, that's difficult. I mean, there's credence in that. But I just for me, it's Connor McDavid. I think if you if you sacrifice the game or just kill the penalty, in my opinion, you need to send a message that that's not okay. Um, the fact that they don't meet again this season, um, I think maybe should have created some yeah. some haste in their reaction. Um, but it is what it is, and we're in a better place now. Um, but I'm, I'm just glad that uh, they've figured out that side of the game. Yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, just going back to talking about how far that the Oilers could take this streak uh, – I predicted before the season that the Oilers would win their first regular season division title since 1986-87. And that prediction wasn't looking great as recently as two weeks ago. But now that the team has gotten healthier and they've made it through the toughest part of their schedule, I think the Oilers have a real shot to finish first in the division. And if you look at the teams ahead of them, Vegas has lost four of their last five games, and they might be without Mark Stone for the rest of the season with an upper body injury. Let's not forget he was out long term last year as well. Seattle has definitely exceeded expectations so far, and I think they'll make the playoffs, but the Oilers are still a better team on paper, and they've beat them twice this season. And as for the Kings, they're just a point ahead of the Oilers, despite having a minus eight goal differential. And if you look at the Flames, I mean, they might not even make the playoffs with the Avalanche right behind them for a wildcard spot. So there's not one team that I think the Oilers couldn't beat in the first two rounds of the playoffs. I do agree. Um, I'm not sure I would have had that sentiment a couple of weeks ago, but um, you know that's uh, that's fandom, right? Um, when I take a step back and try to uh, remove the emotion from it, I I do think that uh, the scoring ability from this team and the recent goaltending performances uh, make us a really scary matchup in the, in the first round of the playoffs. Yep. Um, I I do believe that if we uh, are fortunate enough to go to the final four again. Uh, we will see Colorado there in in some fashion, uh, assuming they're as long as they to... get in. I mean, even if they're in a wild card spot, you never know. Um, like they've had a lot of injury problems themselves too, and that's the only reason why they're they're not in a playoff position as it is. But right now, I think they're two points back of the Flames with two games in hand. So you could easily see the Avs win those games and knock the Flames back out of the the playoff picture as well. And who knows how it's going to go against Dallas, Winnipeg, or Minnesota. Colorado has the talent and the playoff experience that if they go up against any of them, the Avs could probably still win that series, even if they don't have home ice advantage. Although, you know, looking at it, we, we still don't know how healthy that team is going to be come the conference final. And that goes for our group as well. But I just don't think that there's an unbeatable juggernaut the way that the Avs were last year, standing in the Oilers' way to get to the final this year. Um, I mean, yeah, unbeatable is is a word that I I don't think any team can really use. Um, but I think it's money in the bank. They'll be a playoff team. Colorado, it is. Um, it, it's kind of like Vegas last year, where injuries put them in a in a compromised position. But um, Colorado's still close, and I, I do think they'll finish top three in their division. Um, I, I really do believe, though, that uh, the path to the Stanley Cup final 
goes through Colorado, I, I have no mm-hmm. doubts that they'll be uh, in the Western Conference final. Well, we could get a rematch, and sort of like how you mentioned about the Oilers overcoming the Islanders after losing to them in 83 and be, eventually winning their first cup in 84, that might be the Oilers' moment to get by them. And it would be great to have a, some redemption against them, considering how that uh, series ended uh, the Oilers' season last year. Uh, just quickly before we wrap up, uh, who do you envision the Oilers playing in the first round of the playoffs? Well, uh, just to go back to my uh, prediction that I think based on the information we have now uh, and the way the roster is constructed, I think it's reasonable to think this team finishes uh, second in the Pacific. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I guess that would have us playing Seattle. Um, like you said, I look at uh, the Kings goal differential and their their goaltending being what it is. That doesn't exactly fill me with optimism on their uh, on their chances of being anything better than a wild card. Um, Calgary could crawl back, but, uh, they've got a hill to climb and Seattle just seemingly, uh, keeps chugging along. And I mean, they've got a guy on their fourth line right wing spot. Who's got, uh, what, 28 points and 15 goals and, and Daniel Sprong. Um, they are the most deep team lines one through four, possibly in the entire NHL, um, without any superstar talent, but, uh, they don't, they don't need it. So I, I think that, um, Anything could happen in, in this division. It, it seems to be totally up for grabs, but um, I want to say it'll be Edmonton and Seattle in round one. That would be a fun series, too, because all three games against them this year have been relatively entertaining. I mean, the 4-2 loss to uh, Seattle in early January wasn't great, but they started off really strong. They just had that 10-minute period in the second period where they fell apart. Other than that, the, the Oilers absolutely dismantled them with that 7-2 win in uh seattle and then more recently beat them 5-2 in edmonton just last week but i think uh you know just going back to the flames too for a second one of the biggest reasons i think they're also in trouble is because they just lost chris tanov with an injury last night and that's a team that can't afford any type of absence so knowing that the abs are just right on their heels i could see them finishing on the outside looking in exactly um i i do think that's a bit of a concern uh, for calgary um, I mean, if Chris Tanev is healthy, it's a different series. But I, I, in the in the in the playoffs last year, but then again, I guess that uh, would be mitigated by uh, Darnell and Leon being healthy. So maybe it's a bit of a wash there. Exactly. Um, I mean, the Oilers had their number one defenseman and second best player battling through significant injuries, and you know Leon was able to still dominate. But I I really think that you know Nurse, who got hurt with four games left in the regular season struggled through that playoff run you could see that he his skating wasn't nearly where it normally is and and even this year he's still uh, i mean one of the better skating defensemen in the league but he doesn't seem to have the same explosiveness that we've seen him have in past years no i i do think that core injury is still nagging darnell um and obviously he'll he'll have the uh the tag of being a nine and a quarter million dollar defenseman weighing on him. Um, it is what it is in terms of the AAV, but I feel like this 11 and seven really allows him to keep his minutes down and uh, be in that sweet spot of effectiveness around 23, 24 minutes. And if they can bring in another defenseman at the trade deadline to take some of the heavy lifting off Darnell on the back end, that would be a huge thing for this team as well. And we've started to see Philip Broberg emerging as of late. I don't know if you're going to ask him to play in the top four in game one of the playoffs, but we're starting to see some real positive signs from a young player there. Yeah, I mean, the Oilers are in a bit of a, of a quagmire in terms of what do you do? Um, uh, there seems to be a bit of redundancy with, with Barry and Bouchard, but, or sorry, yeah, Barry and Bouchard, but, uh, but Barry is having a really under-the-radar good season for the Oilers. And Bouchard is having a sophomore slump, so I'm not sold on trading Barry either at this point. I think that he's such a good fit with this team, especially on the power play, that even though he might be blocking Bouchard's path a little bit, Bouchard's such a young player that you could hold on to Tyson Barry for at least one more year. And I think that would be good, especially for, for cat management reasons. Um, it's maybe a bit of a blessing that Bouchard isn't lighting it up right now. Um, uh, that's something that we're going to have to be uh, very mindful of is is who we commit money to and, and when. But um, that being said, the time is now. And, and if we have to make a trade to improve this team, um, we have 
by my count, three more opportunities to, to go for the Stanley yeah. Cup, which is when uh, Leon Dreisaitl's contract is is up. Um, the, the time is now. They they have to get this done um, immediately and uh, picks, prospects, uh, uh, anything that isn't nailed down can go. Yeah, this is this is the time to go for it. Uh, last year, too, I, I almost wish that they would have loaded up a little bit more um, at the trade deadline a year ago, but this year, seeing where this team is headed in the right direction and uh, McDavid and Dreisaitl continuing to even exceed their own expectations, you just you have to take the shot at it. And the Avs, like we said, even though you said uh, the road to the final goes through them in the West, I don't think the team is as dominant as it was last season. So there is an opportunity for the Oilers to win there. If they could get a little more help on the back end, they might even bring in another forward uh, names like Jonathan Taves and Bo Horvat have been tossed out there. Who knows if it's uh, one of those guys, or maybe it's a, a an option that isn't as big of a name as those two. But I think that when it's all said and done, Ken Holland will probably try to bring in at least one more forward and another defenseman, especially if they continue to run the 11 and seven model, which Jay Woodcroft really likes to do. That allows you to not have to take a Philip Broberg out of the lineup. If you trade for a veteran defender. If we were to bring in a, a Horvat or a Taves, I believe it would be uh, under the assumption that there would be a third team brokering that. Uh, I can't course, imagine. Yeah. You've got to get like Arizona involved or something because you need the Blackhawks to retain 50% and then maybe Arizona retains another half of that even just to fit it under. But now you're sending another asset to the Coyotes to make it work. And also, I believe Jonathan Taves has a full no trade clause, so he can pretty much pick wherever he wants to go. Maybe the Avs try to bring him in as well. Uh, Maybe he goes to his hometown Winnipeg Jets. There's going to be teams that are looking to bring him in. Uh, Patrick Kane was my my big hope last summer, and I think it was Frank Saravelli who put it out there that the Oilers had mentioned him in internal discussions about bringing him in. But the Oilers score enough goals as it is, and as fun as it would be to watch Kane on the power play with already arguably the best power play in NHL history, I think Taves might stylistically be almost a better fit for the Oilers. Uh, yeah, I mean, he's at this point in his career, he could be a very uh, stereotypically elite third line center. Um, I, I would prefer uh, Bull Horvat for the element he brings. Um, I know it he's depends a bit more. Vancouver's willing to, I mean, would they trade him to a divisional rival, right? I, I feel like even if it's a deadline rental, they probably would look to send him out of the conference, I think. I, I agree. Um <laughs> But, you know, in, in the vein of going for it, maybe the Oilers give them uh, an offer they can't refuse. Um, yeah. Yeah, he, he would be someone who would uh, really put this team in, uh, in firmly entrenched as a cup contender. Um, and I mean, even though we saw McDavid and Dreisaitl play together uh, last year in the playoffs, and that was mainly a function of Dreisaitl being injured and uh, needing to have some of the burden of centering his own line taken off because of the, the high ankle sprain. I, I wonder if they are able to bring in another center. Do you see Woodcroft deciding to go back to McDavid and Drysaddle? Because you could have Nuge centering the second line, whoever they bring in as their new third line center um, with the third unit, and then you could play McDavid and Drysaddle together on the top line. Yeah, at that point, if you have a glut of top six players, and especially centermen, um, I don't see why not. Um, it, it seems like you could probably uh, mix and match. Um, guys like Costin up and down the lineup. Um, yeah, a, a first line of uh, McDavid, Dreisaitl, Hyman, and then a second line of, let's say, Kane, Nuge. Um, and yeah, probably Costin. And then, yeah, you could have Horvat on your third line. I, I mean, that would it, be... It's probably the best top six in the NHL, I would say. And, and probably the best top nine that the Oilers have had, at least since their their dynasty days. Oh, without question. Absolutely. Well, that's awesome, man. All right. Uh, just before we go, uh, you recently joined uh, HockeyFights.com. I just want to talk a little bit about what you're doing over there, how it's been going so far. So just uh, tell me about that. Oh, it's going really well. Um, I've been there for a few months now. Um, I just made a connection with uh, the director of Hockey Fights, uh, Nation Dan, as he's known to, to a lot of you people who are listening. Um, yeah, I just had the, the great fortune of being at the right place at the right time. 
Uh, and so now I am a content creator uh, for hockeyfights.com and it's, it's going quite well. Can you just sort of take me through like, um, what's a, what's a day to day like for you working at a hockey fights? Uh, it's really just trying to keep on the pulse of, uh, uh, guys throughout, uh, the sport who I think are, um, personalities that should be highlighted. Um, just, you know, using our social media channels and, and selecting fighters and, and fights themselves that I think, uh, um, our viewers would be interested in seeing, um, really just trying to, um, highlight uh, the fact that there there is still uh good fights that happen maybe not so much in the nhl but around the a and especially major junior um there, there's a lot of guys who maybe aren't getting the notoriety that they deserve but uh, they're keeping the spirit of, of fighting alive in the sport and as an oilers fan how much more enjoyable has work been to see a few more oilers fights on there and also is there one video that has really done strong numbers for you as of late? Uh, I mean, the, the big videos are obviously always the, uh, the NHL ones. Um, um, <laughs> uh, there's a lot of guys in the dub, uh, such as Matthew Edwards, for example. Um, whenever he has a fight, it's, it's usually something very special. Um, uh, Mitch McLean, for, for example, on the, on the Calgary Wranglers, he's, he's a guy that I look forward to watching. Uh, so one particular fight, no. I just think we have a really good roster of guys uh, in hockey right now, especially in North America, who are doing a really good job. That's awesome, man. Well, look, best of luck over there. I know you're going to do a great job. You were awesome with Fur to Oil as well. So uh, just congrats on the new position and uh, best of luck going forward for you and the Edmonton Oilers the rest of the season. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And where can people follow you? Uh, I would love for people to go visit uh, hockeyfights.com uh, and uh, my more personal account on Instagram and Twitter is post cologne. All right. So everyone, please check out hockeyfights.com and go give post a follow. If you aren't already following him post, thanks again. Let's hopefully do this again at some point this season. Can't wait. So for post cologne, I'm Eric Friesen. This has been the 99 forever podcast. We're out. <laughs>